Good morning, good morning. Have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. Welcome to Encounter. We're glad that you guys are here this day, this Father's Day. Happy day for all the dads. We're going to acknowledge you here in just a minute. I want to give some announcements first uh, to let you know what's going on in the life of the church. And there are things that are going on. Uh, I know that we've uh, been kind of on, on uh, hiatus in a lot of ways under the, the, this quarantine and all the things that have been going on with that. But uh, we continue to uh, be in ministry and continue to be active and continue to be doing things. I, I keep, I got to remember that there's actually video. There are people watching us at home, so I got to stand where they can see me. So I can't just be moving around down there. So anyway, announcement wise, I want to share with you what's going on. Children's Ministry Park parking lot play day. It's going to happen June 27th from 1030 till noon in the parking lot next to the FLC, which is right out there. Uh, there are going to be all kinds of, they're asking you to bring your bikes or scooters and towels for some fun in the parking lot. They're going to have snow cones, sprinklers, and water games, and uh, uh, and they're going to do this in a way that try to social distance as best as possible and have lots of fun. So uh, kiddos, be aware of that Saturday, June 27th. Uh, in July, we're doing Blue Jean Sundays. Uh, you're invited and welcome to bring your blue jeans and, and wear them when you come. You know, don't just bring them, but wear them uh, on, in the month of July. And also bring a pair of blue jeans to give away. Uh, we uh, have done this before. We, so during the entire month of July, you're encouraged to wear your blue jeans and then bring either a gently worn pair of blue jeans or if you want to go out and buy a, a pair of blue, blue jeans, we're going to donate those to the Mission House. So when they reopen back up, they are fully stocked with... Uh, with blue jeans for folks. Those have been very popular. They went off the shelves immediately, uh, so please be aware of that. UM Army and Summit are, are happening this summer. It's just going to be done a little differently. If you don't know what those are, Summit is our junior high mission trip, and UM Army is our high school age mission trip. They're going to be done uh, together uh, over, they're going to be meeting at Pollard United Methodist Church uh, July 29th through, that's 31st, is the is this what is it 26 through okay 26 through 31st is the full week 29th through 31st is the junior high part of it so the the junior i'm going to get all confused now you threw me off bruce i blame you all the way no um so anyway what it is is jun, high school will meet first and they're going to stay the whole week and then junior high is going to join them at the end of the week that weekend there is that correct patrick okay perfect so um they're going to be, this is a day thing, so they're not staying overnight, that way they can maintain social distancing, grouping, and stuff like that, um, and uh, there'll be uh, uh, senior high, if you're church members, it's only cost $200, and junior high, if you're church members, it only costs $75, if you ha need more information about that, talk to Patrick, who's in the back back there, okay? They're also needing supplies for this event, uh, teams will need hand sanitizer, paper towels, rubbing alcohol, liquid hand soap, Clorox wipes. Uh, for these day camps, uh, and so please be aware of that. Uh, you can drop those off at the church office. You can bring them up here on a Sunday if you want, uh, but uh, please know about that. Uh, four ways of giving now. We used to talk about the three ways of giving, but now we're talking about the four ways of giving here. We've got our, our boxes when you come in the door. We're not passing offering plates because of, you know, just trying to maintain social distancing, not have a bunch of touch surfaces. So the gray boxes when you come in, if you want to drop off your offering on the way out, you can do that if you didn't do it on the way in. You can mail in your offering. You can uh, email, or you can do it by online uh, on our website, or you can drop it off at the church office on the secure drop box or in the office itself. So please be aware of that. Uh, some, th some things that were sent out to you this morning are go beyond, grow beyond questions. We send you a set of questions that deal with the sermon today and give you a chance to grow a little bit beyond where we are uh, in the in the topic, kind of dig in a little deeper into the topic and engage it a little bit more so that you grow uh, spiritually. So those questions have been sent out this morning. And then also uh, we have two of our Sunday school classes uh, that send out a video from their teachers. Um, and those videos went out this morning as well. That's Open Door and Fellowship class. I know we have some other classes that are doing things a little bit differently, either through Zoom and things like that. So please be aware of that. Um, let's see, a couple other things. Uh, one, dismissal today, as we've been trying to do just for social distancing purposes, will be done by sections, so don't just take off. Uh, we'll, we'll dismiss you by sections. That way we kind of avoid a bottleneck on the, the way out. Uh, and then um, I want to uh, talk about a couple of transitions that are going on in our church staff. 
Uh, one, uh, we're very sad to announce, you probably saw this already this week, that our, our uh, student ministries director, Patrick Foster, is uh, taking a, uh, what, oh, Patrick Foster, I thought you were correcting me there for a minute, maybe I said Robert on accident. I always get Robert and Patrick mixed up, I don't know why I do that, I just do that, but anyway, so Patrick is, is going to be taking a, a new position as an assistant youth director down in Jacksonville at the end of the summer. Uh, Patrick, you may or may not know this, uh, has not only been our youth director, but he's been a full-time teacher, a uh, special ed teacher down in Jacksonville, and also has been working on uh, his graduate uh, level work and graduate school. And so uh, that's a lot to balance, and uh, Patrick has done it with grace and style, uh, but it begins to wear on you after a while. And so uh, this opportunity that Patrick has with Jacksonville uh, allows him to continue to have his hand in ministry and do some wonderful work with kids. Uh, but it's not, it doesn't have the, the, the higher responsibilities that we have for him and things like that. And so uh, we're very sad uh, that Patrick's going to be transitioning uh, to Jacksonville, but we completely understand and we're going to send him with our prayers and with our blessing as well. In fact, we're going to do something along those lines a little bit later on. Uh, in the meantime, you can know that uh, we are uh, uh, in a, a search for a uh, youth director. In fact, we have a, an interview coming up this week uh, with a potential candidate. So please be praying for, for that. The other transition we want to let you know about is uh, we have a new, uh, a, a new uh, janitor, and uh, Randy is with us this morning. Randy, would you stand up right where you are? I think they can see you from over there. That's Randy Dempsey. We want to welcome him. Uh, he and his wife, Laura, have been coming to church for some time now, and, and uh, we're really glad to have him part of the staff. Things are looking great around here, and we really appreciate you helping us keep clean and sanitary and, and all that kind of good stuff. So, all right, real quick. I'm sorry. I know that's a lot of talking and yapping. I just been forever since I've been up here, it seems like. So, um, fathers, we've got something special for you today. This is, uh, uh, when you leave today, you're each going to be, uh, can receive this, this uh, container of, of seasoning, it's meat seasoning. So you can, uh, it's a dry rub, you can put it on your meats. It says, seasoned with love, happy Father's Day from Bullard First United Methodist Church. We are doing this uh, in conjunction with actually First Baptist. Uh, they, uh, uh, put this together and, and said, hey, you want to join us in doing this? We're giving this to all the dads. And so this is a, uh, a seasoning that uh, has been mixed up. It's salt, black pepper, garlic, dried oregano, paprika, cornstarch, onion powder, chili powder, cumin, crushed red pepper, and cayenne pepper. So dads on the way out, they'll be on the uh, table and uh, be sure to grab one uh, for Father's Day on the way out. Let's say a quick prayer and give thanks for our dads. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for this day and this opportunity to worship you and to give you glory and praise and honor. And we pray, Father, that uh, uh, today as we honor dads, we, we give thanks for the, the men who have been an influence on our lives. Whether that influence is through uh, uh, being our biological dads, but also, Lord, those men in our lives that have been like spiritual dads to us, those that have been encouragers to us, those that uh, have been the ones that have held us accountable and pointed us in the right direction. Uh, we thank you for all the men who have had a positive influence in our lives, Lord. Uh, and we give you thanks this day for all of them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Real quickly, we're going to stand. We're going to do our greeting. Remember, we're going to stay where we are and do our waves and everything like that. And then we're going to continue on with worship. Yes and amen. All 
your promises are yes and amen. Thank you. 
is running out of an empty grave, seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave, seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory thrown on the highest praise you send the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated seated among us let every heart receive him now where there is praise he will inhabit there will be grace and mercy all around every burden will be lifted in his presence every trophy will be laid down at his feet there is a name that reigns above all others jesus christ king above all to the land, honor and glory, worthy is he who overcame, buried in shame, risen in power, he is alive and the stone is rolled away, and all our worship will belong to him forever death is conquered and our savior holds the key there is an age that reigns above all others jesus christ the king above all face to face and every burden 
will be lifted in his presence. Every trophy will be laid down at his feet. There is an end that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. All our worship will belong to you forever. Holy, holy, for all eternity. Yours is the name that reigns above. Christ, the King above all kings. Jesus Christ, the King above all so much for being here today. We love you. God, as we continue this morning, I pray that you stay with us. God, open our ears, open our eyes, and open our hearts to you. Take us deeper, Father. More than anything, that's what we want, God, to encounter you in a deeper way, to know more of who you are. Take us there, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you guys so much. I love that last song. It's so beautiful, isn't it? You guys will remain standing. I'm having a little trouble here with this thing. We're going to read our scripture here in a second. I want to wish all the dads out there a happy Father's Day. I hope you are treated very specially today because you are. And we are glad you are here with us. Our uh, scripture today comes from Philippians chapter 1, three verses. And why does this keep going down? We're going to fix it here. Who knows how to work this? All right, maybe it'll stay now. All right, here we go. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's take a moment for a word of prayer. Father, quiet our hearts. Settle our minds. Clear all the dust out. Clear out the distractions, God. And speak to us right now in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we are in our third week in our sermon series, The Joy-Filled Life. This series through the book of Philippians is going to take us all the way into August as we study this wonderful book whose theme is joy. And today we are focusing on the theme of living worthy of the gospel and what that means for us. Next week, David is going to be preaching about humility. And um, I just think this is going to be a great series. I love the book of Philippians. And so I hope that whether you're coming uh, here 
in person or you're worshiping with us online, that you will continue with us as we make our way through the book of Philippians. And uh, I don't know about you all, but I think I could stand to hear a lot more about joy. So I'm looking forward to it. Well, there was a man who decided to go off and join a monastery. And of course, that requires an oath of silence. No speech is allowed except for two words once every five years, just to sum up the person's experiences to the head abbot. And so after the first five years, the abbot asked the man what two words describes his experiences that he's had. And he replies with two words, hard beds. And so after the next five-year period came, the abbot asked how things were, and he replied, bad food. And so after five more years, he walked up to the abbot and said, I quit. And the abbot nodded and muttered, well, that doesn't surprise me. All you've done is complain for the last 15 years. By a show of hands, how many of you have ever made an oath or a pledge? If you're married, you better raise your hands because when you get married, at least in the church, you make an oath. You pledge yourself to your spouse. You make a promise before God and before your spouse that you are going to cherish them, love them, be loyal to them for the rest of your life. Now, I know we have some former or current Boy Scouts here with us. So I'm going to recite the Boy Scout Oath, and if you know it, please say it out loud along with me. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country, to obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. The Girl Scout promise is similar, so if you know it, say that with me now. On my honor, I will try to serve God and my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law. There are many different oaths that people make. Men and women joining the military take an oath to support and defend the Constitution, as do our lawmakers and most every elected official in the country. When we make an oath or a pledge, we are making a promise to behave in a certain way, to live our lives in a way that honors the organization or the person or the country to whom we are pledging. As Christians, we have made a pledge to Christ. We have sworn allegiance to him as Lord and Savior. And we have said that we want to live in a way that honors him. Let's unpack that first part of verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of of the gospel of Christ. What does that mean? The first thing, let's not gloss over those first two words, whatever happens. Other translations say just one thing, most important, above all else, only. Paul is emphasizing the importance of living life in a way that honors the good news of Jesus. In the original language, the word that Paul used for conduct yourselves has the meaning of taking a personal active role in the political affairs of the state. In other words, being a citizen. Live your lives as worthy citizens of the gospel of Christ. Later in chapter 3, Paul writes these words, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, 
the Lord Jesus Christ. The use of this word citizen would have had special meaning to the church at Philippi since they had been living as proud Roman citizens, enjoying all the benefits of citizenship. But Paul says to them that they need to stop thinking of themselves first as Roman citizens and instead as citizens of heaven who happen to live in a Roman colony. They needed to shift their loyalties. No longer could they go along with the proclamation that Caesar was Lord and Savior, and that is what was proclaimed. They have chosen Christ as Lord and Savior, and now they must live as if they are living in a foreign land. You all know what an embassy is. An embassy refers to both a permanent diplomatic mission and the building in which that mission is housed. The United States has em embassies all over the world that serve as a contact point between us as the visiting country and the host country that we're in. Each embassy then has an ambassador who acts as the U.S. representative in the foreign land. Well, the church is God's embassy, and we, as Christians, are his ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says this, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. As believers and ambassadors, we need to remember that we are living in a foreign land because our citizenship is in heaven. And just like the U.S. ambassadors living in foreign countries have to be careful to follow their host country's rules but still abide by the U.S. laws as ambassadors for Christ, we need to be careful how we live because we are representing Christ. Yes, we are American citizens, and most of us are pretty proud of that. Yes, we pledge allegiance to our country. But the more important thing, the most important thing, is that we are citizens of heaven. Our priority has to be to live as kingdom citizens. Well, for us, that means living in a manner worthy of the gospel in an increasingly hostile and unbelieving world. Now, let's look at what it means to live worthy of the gospel. First, living worthy of the gospel doesn't mean that we're perfect or that we pretend to be perfect because we are not. What it does mean is that we are humble. A life that is lived out in allegiance to the gospel, pledged to Christ as Lord, is one that is humble, just as Christ was humble, even though he is divine. I'm not going to spend too much time on this point because next week's sermon will be all about humility as we look more closely in chapter 2 at the Christ hymn. So I will simply say that living worthy of the gospel has to happen with humility. It's clear throughout the New Testament, as we look at the example of Christ, that humility is one of the most important Christian traits that we can have. So stay tuned next week for more on humility. Let's move on to the second trait of a life worthy of the gospel, and that is one of unity. Unity with one another. Paul says that he will know that the Philippians are following Christ if they are standing firm in one spirit and striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we are bound in one spirit. We have a common Savior, we have a common purpose. And I don't just mean the members of Bullard First United Methodist Church. 
we are bound together with all Christians throughout all time and all places. We are bound together, and our message is the gospel message, and our vision is to spread that message. If you look out at the world, the predominant message is one of fighting and discord and negativity. It's pretty tough to find examples of people working in unity. But Paul says that living a life worthy of Christ is standing and working together for the sake of our mission. In other words, living in unity. Working together in unity has a lot to do with the first point, humility. Living worthy means putting self-concern aside to work together, realizing that we are all still a work in progress. None of us are perfect. None of us are right 100% of the time. None of us have all the answers. All of us need grace. Living in unity is showing the same grace to each other that God has given to us, overlooking our sins and giving us his unmerited love. Ephesians 4 says this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Humble gentle, loving, peaceful. Does that describe us? If not, then we have some work to do. Will Christians agree on everything? Of course not. But can we seek unity in our relationships with one another? Absolutely. And I hope we do. We don't have to agree on everything to live in unity. Because if we are truly committed to living lives worthy of the gospel, then we become people of grace. And grace says, I'm going to treat everyone with kindness, even if I don't agree with them. Grace says, I'm going to offer peace, not stir up strife and anger. Grace says, I'm going to overlook offenses and forgive other people, not hold grudges. Grace says, I'm going to love other people to Christ, not condemn them because they don't agree with me. That is grace. We are called to be a people of unity and grace who work together for the common purpose of bringing others into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. The world needs to see our example of grace. They need to see us offering grace to one another and to the world. And they are watching us. They watch us. Are we united in love and grace? Is it evident in our public behavior? A life worthy of the gospel is also a fearless life. Fearless. Paul encourages us to live courageously in the face of opposition. I'm sorry to say this, but the world is full of half-hearted, back-peddling, fearful Christians. Christians who say they believe in God and Jesus is their Savior, but when push comes to shove and it's time to be courageous in their faith, they retreat. They suddenly have no voice to speak up against sin. They have no backbone to say, no, I'm not going to do that, or I'm not going to say that, or I'm not going to act in that way, because that goes against what the pledge that I have made to honor Jesus. They do what they know is wrong just to fit in. There are too many Christians who are ashamed of their faith. They're afraid to live out their faith in public because of what people might think. 
They're embarrassed to stand up to the cultural norms. They're afraid to appear too religious to their friends or their coworkers, and so they end up downplaying their faith. And that is a dangerous game to play because the way we act in public is how people see us, how they judge us and our faith. It's how they judge the one who we say we are following. So if we are ashamed to truly live as real, authentic Christians, then maybe, maybe we're only fake Christians. A mature Christian is unashamed and unafraid to stand up for his or her beliefs in the way they speak and the way they live. Romans chapter 1 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Being fearless in the face of opposition means we don't fear people. We fear God. God is the one who dictates our behavior, not people. Are you afraid of losing your job if your boss realizes you're a Christian? Are you afraid you won't get promoted if you refuse to go along with tactics that go against Christianity? Are you afraid you won't be included or invited if people find out you're a disciple of Christ? Are you more afraid of what people think than what God thinks? Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever puts trust in the Lord is kept safe. Don't let fear of people control you. It will if you let it. Put your trust in God and be obedient to living a life worthy of Jesus. It doesn't mean that hardship won't come your way. It doesn't mean that things will always be easy. But your courage in the face of opposition is your greatest witness to salvation. It's the best witness and you, that you can offer to the world. We can't let the world influence us. We need to influence the world. So don't be a half-hearted Christian. Don't be a private-only Christian or a part-time Christian. Be a fearless and unashamed Christian, living out your faith no matter who you're with or where you are. The last point I want to make is living a life worthy of the gospel is living a joyful life. You're wondering when I get to the joy part, right? This is about joy. It doesn't mean that we won't have problems. It doesn't mean that we won't face opposition. It, it doesn't even mean that we will always be happy. So how do we live this joyful life no matter the circumstances? Living a joyful life is living chasing after God. Chase after him all the time, in all the places. Look for him. It's, it's looking for God everywhere, all the time, expectantly. It means living with a deep spiritual longing to truly know God's heart and a desire to be changed in the understanding of him. That's joyful living. A joyful life is one that hungers after his goodness, drinking it all up until it's just part of you and it just overflows as love and grace into the world. A joyful life is a life of gratitude and thankfulness for who God is, and for all that he has done, no matter the circumstances or the difficulty. Let me close with this. There are two different girls that our daughter grew up with in Plano who 
have both experienced the most profound pain and grief that you could imagine. Both lost a child. Both are strong, courageous Christian women married to strong, courageous Christian men. And both have astounded me with their steadfast faith and their joy in the midst of terrible heartbreak. One lost her beautiful two-year-old boy in a tragic accident only one year ago yesterday. In the loving and sweet obituary for their son a year ago, they closed by asking people to consider joining them in their family prayer. They had a family prayer. And it's this. We live in joyful expectancy of your provision. Establish us in love. Wherever you lead us, we will trust in you alone. That is amazing faith. A few years back, the other friend had to deliver their baby whose heart had stopped beating and hold his tiny body while they said goodbye. She wrote these words. The nurses broke his waters and handed him to us, one softly saying, it's a boy and he's perfect. Oh, how right she was. Our third beautiful baby boy, I remember how perfectly he fit in my hands, covered in glory and grace. His glory eclipsed us. It overshadowed pain with great, great awe and peace and, weirdly enough, joy. These two families suffered terrible, terrible loss the kind of loss that some people never recover from. And yet, because of their fearless faith in Christ, because they knew that their true citizenship was in heaven, because their deepest desire was to know God's heart and to seek after him always, they were able to find joy even in the deepest sorrow. My prayer for you and I is that we are those kind of Christians. That in these times fraught with crisis and uncertainty and turmoil, we will be humble, united, fearless, and joyful. May we live our lives worthy of the gospel of our joy giver, Jesus. Amen and amen. I'm going to invite the band to make their way back up here. And while they do that, I want to extend an invitation to you. If you're here today and you want to know more about this man Jesus and how he can make your life that joy-filled, then I invite you to come and talk to David or I or come up here up front if you're ready to accept him as your Savior, and we will gladly celebrate that with you. If you would like to know more about joining our church as a member and being part of the mission and ministries of Bullard First United Methodist Church, I invite you to come talk to David or I. Talk to us after the service or talk to us this week, and we'll be happy to share with you what that means to be a member of this church. And we look forward to that. Guys, lead us in our next song.
that last slide up for me as we just oh I'm sorry no the last one the prayer the family prayer there you go um, let's say this together and this will be our benediction we live in joyful expectancy of your provision establish us in love wherever you lead us we will trust in you alone. Go in peace and joy and love. Amen. And amen. Let's dismiss by section. So uh, if you're ready to go, this section can go ahead first. We'll give them a minute. You guys can just entertain us for a minute. Okay, how about uh, this section? Go ahead and, and go now. Y'all have a great week. Okay, y'all can go, go ahead. Everyone's dismissed. Good to see y'all. I know, I know.